Hello and welcome to this workshop. Um, this is going to be uh, APIs and events, two sides of the same coin. Um, all right, so I'll just go ahead and, and get started. Um, so here at IBM, uh, we love APIs and uh, we, you know, we think they're great and um, we think that they have tons and tons of applications. However, um, APIs don't solve everything. Um, and there are some, there are characteristics that we apply to API management that we'd like to apply to other technologies. So for the most part, and, and I'm gonna play, I'm gonna do something a little bit different here. Uh, I'm gonna play with definitions. So traditionally, APIs have been applicable to REST going over HTTP or HTTPS. And that's pretty much, whenever we say a REST API, um, that's generally what we mean. Now, API, the term API has been around forever. You know, I mean, we used to call uh, Java, you know, if I wrote a Java class and I created an interface, you know, we used to call those APIs. Um, but, you know, for the most part, whenever we talk about APIs, we talk about um, REST going over HTTP. Um, and, and that's great. Um, it, it's a nice, succinct definition. But there are things about APIs that, you know, maybe we'd like to apply to other technologies or other things. Uh, the, the most natural fit is events. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about Kafka events. Um, it's a very natural fit to say, geez, I really like how discoverable APIs are. I really like how, you know, there's a bunch of tools in the marketplace where I could look at, look through, browse your APIs. I could figure out which ones I want to call, and then I can self-subscribe and I can call your APIs. It's a natural, it, it's natural. But now what if I took that exact same sentiment, that exact same thinking, and I applied it to events? Jeez, you know, maybe I don't want to always interact with an object. Uh, maybe I want to, you know, be notified of somebody else interacting with an object. Um, and, and we really feel like events fit in that space very naturally. Um, and, and, you know, also, um, so I'll go through a couple of use cases here and, and kind of what I'm, what I'm on about. Um, so the first is, you know, HTTP has a timeout. Um, so, and, and generally you do this to protect the consumers. So as a consumer, I'm only going to wait, you know, X seconds, you know, 5, 10, 30 seconds for an individual HTTP transaction. And, you know, I have to abandon the transaction after that amount of time because otherwise you get a buildup, right, where you have too many concurrent transactions at a given point in time, consume so many resources, and then your consumer goes down. Um, so that's a long way of saying there's a natural uh, limit on how long you're willing to uh, to wait for for an action, right? An action to occur. Um, that that's great, right? And and that makes sense, right? It makes sense from an HTTP perspective why you'd have a timeout, why you why you try to protect your consumers uh, from a timeout. However, um, not all business events, not all business transactions can occur within that period of time. Um, I'll give an example. Let's say that um, my my application has some type of human intervention, right? I I want to issue a REST call to to start an action, right? I want to issue a REST call that says I want to acknowledge. I want to I want to take some action. Um, it, it really here's an example. Um, I'm 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 in a store, um, UPS, FedEx, whatever. I'm, I'm in a store and I'm trying to deliver uh, deliver a package or I'm trying to drop off some package. Well, I might want to issue a REST request saying I'm here and I'm here to deliver packages or pick up packages. But then there's got to be some human interaction, right? Somebody has to go in, they have to get the packages, I have to physically give them to somebody. And then that, that could take an indeterminate amount of time. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe the person is busy, maybe you know, it's hard to find the package, whatever. Um, and then after the package is, is comes back, I want to emit a, a note of, you know, another API call or another uh, event that says, I've, you know, I've, 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 I've found it, right? I found the physical thing. Um, so, so with that being the case, it's not always the best fit for, 
for rest because it's not always, I want you to do something, you do said thing, and then you can return back before the timeout. Um, so, so how do we accommodate this? Well, one way to do it is the consumer sends the original you know, request and then on response, you get an acknowledgement. All the, all the, the server side doing in this case is application two is just saying, yeah, I've acknowledged um, that I've acknowledged that you you've sent me uh, a request, but I haven't done it. I'm just letting you know that you're in the queue to be worked on. Um, and so there's kind of two ways you could do it. Either the consumer can constantly be saying, are you done yet? No. 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 Or, you know, probably more optimally is um, on the initial request of application one, the consumer saying, could you do this long-term transaction for me? The provider, in this case, application two, what I'm showing on the screen, returns back and says, I've got your request. You're in the queue. Work is being done. Um, here's, the, here's, here's where you should go to listen for the acknowledgement. Um, and then, you know, you could send an event back and then the application gets it in real time. Um, they get that event. So there's one use case of there's transactions that are taking longer than the HTTP timeout. So how do we accomplish those? Well, there's the one, the constant polling, um, which is just inefficient for both the server side and the client side. And then the second approach is I'm waiting and just notify me, send me an event whenever you've completed the action I'm waiting on. So that, that use case, that long running transaction, uh, it really kind of highlights the point, and this is this is what we mean by two APIs and events are two sides of the same coin. Just like I, as a consumer, so now let's let's take our hat and say I'm a consumer and I'm writing my application against your APIs and events. Just as I would want to discover your APIs and I would like to self-subscribe to your APIs, it, it sure would make a lot of sense. And not all use cases, but some that I would also want to subscribe and, and view your events, right? Notify me. It's a more elegant architecture. So that's that's kind of one, one use case of where we see APIs and events. The second use case, and, and this one is, is very near and dear to me, is um, APIs I feel like are best used for I'm interacting with an object. So I have, let's say I have the customer object. The customer represents me, right? I'm a consumer and I'm I'm a customer to many, many companies. Uh, my, my insurance company, my bank, uh, you know, the various different retail stores I buy stuff from, um, I'm a consumer. Um, and they would represent me as a, as a customer, an entity. Um, here's my name, here's my address, here's my email address, here's my phone number. Um, so if, if you want to interact with me, um, if you want to say, I want to change my email address, well, that's naturally a put on a rest call. If you want to create me in your system, well, that's naturally going to be a post uh, in, in your system. If you want to get information about me, that's naturally going to be an HTTP get. Um, all great things. But let's say you don't want to interact with me. Um, let's say that I'm an analytics engine or I'm an email distribution engine. And I want to react to things that I'm doing. So let's say that I, I, I'm, 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 you're a bank and I'm your customer and I, you know, I, I withdraw money or I, I move money from one account to another or even, or, you know, even, you know, different is I'm consistently moving my money out of your bank to another bank. Well, you might want to know that, right? And you might want to look at my trends. You might want to do analytics on my behavior. You might care about what I'm doing, you might say, oh, geez, it looks like he's switching banks. You know, have we done something wrong? How could we save this business? Um, that's great for notifications, right? So in this case, I would be the consumer inter interacting with application one uh, or application two, and application two is going to notify me or notify people about my, my behavior. So I'd put an event on the topic and then and then application one that's receiving the event could be anything, right? It could be a, hey, we need to to get a hold of Nick's local branch so they could reach out to see why is he moving his money around? Is he leaving us? Um, maybe you want to, you know, notify an uh, an uh, analytics engine so that you could, you know, anonymize me and then look at my trends, right? There's 
there's a tons of different ways, right? So I personally view APIs as you're interacting with the object, get, put, post, you know, create, update, delete, you're interacting with me. I view events as you're being notified of my interactions or my behavior, right? And, and, and I'm just using me as the object, right? But the object could be anything. The object could be uh, account, uh, you know, the various different accounts that I have with our theoretical bank. It could be me, the entity. I could be the consumer. Uh, if I'm your insurance company, it could be claims, right? As a claim is going through its process and being underwritten, uh, being paid out, you might want to notify uh, other people, you know, especially in a workflow. Hey, the ball's been passed from you to you. Uh, that's a great, you know, that's a great use case for an event, right? It's it's a beautiful use case for an event. So just like we want APIs to be discoverable, and we want APIs to be uh, to be seen, you could say, and it would be reasonable to say, uh, geez, you know, this makes a lot of sense to extend into events as well. So those are kind of the use cases, and that's kind of the the high level. Um, what's going on, how do APIs fit with events, uh, and, and, and really what are the synergies between the two? Um, and then we're going to move uh, a little bit into, okay, so what? Um, so now let's kind of look at, um, let's kind of look at the organizational structure. Um, and we've seen this for a number of years now, um, and it's becoming more and more. So uh, effectively what microservices says, and this is really a microservices concept, is microservices says, Break things down into small chunks, small individual chunks that you can um, then iterate quicker on. Um, bounded context and you know a little bit of microservices says, all right, so I want to break things into smaller chunks. Well, based off of what, right? But, you know, I just smaller to be smaller. Am I aligning via business use case? Am I aligning like technologies? What am I doing? Um, far and away, the industry has said. Uh, align into business use cases, right? Or business objects, customer, account, claims, that kind of thing. And so what this bubble or this, this gray box is meant to represent is one of those bounded contexts, one of those applications. Um, so back in the day, it used to be easy. It used to be an application was a deployable unit, right? I had an ear file. That ear file had a ton of different jar files in it. And I deployed that, and that was my application. And everything was calling each other via Java APIs. Now we're expanding. Um, and we have some applications, which is saying, I have a monolith, and then uh, it's made of series of microservices, and then other applications, which are just microservice-based. This dark green line, or this dark blue line, represents the gateways. Um, so, you know, if, if we are kind of looking at it from an enterprise point of view, we're saying there's there's multiple different applications. Those applications are architected differently. And then each one of them has a gateway. Um, now, what are we seeing more and more? How has this changed over the last three years? The way this has changed over the last three years is now these applications are getting their own autonomy. Their, their, their ability to make decisions independently of one another. So what does that lead to? Well, that leads to this application saying, I want to run on-prem. This application saying, well, I want to run in AWS. This application saying, ah, for me, it makes more sense to run on-prem. This one says, I want to run in Google Cloud and Azure. So one of the things that, that we think is super important is, um, is a, a unified a unified dev portal experience. So it's all about the customers, or I shouldn't say customers. It's all about the consumers. It's all about your consumers. So your consumers could care less if your API is hosted on-prem or Azure or Google or AWS or our cloud, I care less. All I want is give me the business functions that use exposed via APIs. And that's what these little bubbles represent, align with the bubble. Now the line with the event, or the <laughs> gave it away, the line with the arrow represents an event, right? So ideally you have this mix of APIs and events so that I could say this application here, I'm super interested in interacting with it, but I'm also super interested in being notified of things that I'm interested in that application being acted on. 
I, I want the events. So if we kind of look at it from an enterprise point of view, we're going to have various different applications that are written in various different architectures, monolith versus microservices in varying different technologies, and then even a step farther on varying different public clouds. So this is, this is you know, quite the challenge. Um, and, and where the real challenge comes in is our consumers are basically going to say, I don't care about any of that. I really don't. I don't care if you're microservices or monolith. I don't care if you're on-prem or if you're, you know, if you're in a, a cloud. I don't care if you're containers or VMs. Just, just show me the business functions that you have exposed over the network. And, and that's what, so basically your consumer's line or what your consumer sees is above the line. And that's all they really care about. And, and we want to differentiate and, and make that this interface here as friendly and as easily consumable as possible. So how do we do that? Well, we want to extend the thinking of APIs to events, right? We want to extend those same quality attributes of, you know, I want to be able to describe the event. I want to be able to discover the event. The event's got to be decentralized because this is the model we're working in now. And then I got to decouple the, the event from the front end to the back end. Um, now, you know, one thing that we, you know, we keep hearing about over and over and over is the north-south APIs versus the east-west APIs. And that actually matches this picture pretty good, right? The north-south APIs are going to be the ones that are going north and south. And then the east-west APIs are going to be what I haven't represented here, but it's going to be this intercommunication. So you're going to have this this concept of how do I how do I take east west APIs, categorize them, find them out, and then decide which ones of those I want to publish and promote to be a north south API. So what do we do? Well, step one is we got to describe the APIs. Um, I'm a firm believer. You know, I think most people are a firm believer is in that the way that you describe APIs or events is with open source tooling and open source standards. I, I do not want to tie into an individual uh, vendor's spec, or I don't want to tie into an open source spec that only one vendor uses. I just want the, what is the standard, and I'm going to stick to the standard. Um, far and away, the most common is 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 the open API spec. Um, that's usually what we see the most. Um, and uh, so, you know, we want to standardize on that. And, and we want to, so not only do we want to standardize on something that's open, um, but we also want to make our APIs clearly, uh, clearly, you know, describable. So, you know, a trick, a trick that we used to do, and I'm going to go back about 10 years, 10, 12 years here, and I'm going to describe a, a trick that used to drive me insane. So back in the in the Wizdal soap days, um, you know, every now and again, you'd see a Wizdal with an operation, and the input was a string, and the output was a string. And then what we would do is we would do C data, and then we we you know then C data would be take basically tech XML, make it into a string, remove all the special characters, and would put it in there. And and the, the argument for why you'd want to do that is it's infinitely flexible. Sure. Yeah, sure, sure. Fair argument. It was infinitely, infinitely flexible. However, as a consumer, input string, output string, it, it didn't, didn't tell me anything, right? It didn't, didn't tell me. What am I expecting? What are the fields? What does the objects look like? What is the, what is the cardinality between these objects? Um, that's also, that's also going to, that, that, that thinking, that concept is also going to marry over into REST APIs, right? So we also want to describe our APIs by saying, you call account, here are the operations, here's the request parameters, here's the object, here's exactly the object that you want, here's what you're going to get back and forth. Um, so that's important, right? To me, that's important is I get infinitely flexible, I get that you could you know, make changes and not have to change the interface. I get it. But the problem with that is you're not telling your consumers anything and you're making your consumers life pretty hard. So we wanted to be able to describe events, right? We want to be able to 
to clearly articulate what you're getting the to and the from side or on the event side, what you're getting on, you know, what the event payload is. Another thing that we think is, is critically important is discovery. Um, so just like APIs, just like I want to go through and I want to say what's out there, what do I call, what do you expose that I could then cobble together and make my application work? I want to discover. I don't want to, I don't want to set up meetings. I don't want to talk about it. I just want to see what's out there and use it um, so that I could be self-sufficient. So that's a that's that's another thing that we want to go through, and then decentralize. Decentralize goes goes back up to that um, up to that uh, that first slide. And to me, decentralize is really about working independently. Um, the more that I can work independently, and the less dependencies that I have on others, uh, the quicker I can go. Right? The quicker I'm not waiting for something. You know, my destiny is kind of in control of my own hands, and I can I can just work. And, and produce things. Um, so that's a, that's another really positive thing is I want to be able to decentralize and I want to give people the flexibility and the options to make decisions that best suits their use case. Um, then the, the, the last is uh, decoupled, right? We've been talking about decoupled for years and years and years. This isn't really a new concept, but the fact that it's not new and the fact that it's not you know, anything out of the norm or this isn't something we've heard of before doesn't mean it's not powerful, right? It's just as powerful as, as it's always been. So we always want to loosely couple our systems. Um, where this one, is, I think, is, is really important, the decoupling of the systems is going to be uh, between the east-west to north-south promotion. So whenever we're we have things in our application and we're communicating back and forth that east west it's usually you know what is what do i need to do to get this use case right what do i need to do to get this use case off the ground then after a period of time and we've been developing things we say geez you know some of that stuff that we made for this other project is gold and and, and i really think that other people could um could benefit from this but there's a problem when we did it in the context of that application, it doesn't really match all of the other APIs. We didn't really follow the naming standards. It, it, it's, it's good, right? But it doesn't really, it's not as matchy as I'd like it to be. And the problem with that is it's going to confuse my consumers, right? My consumers are going to say, ah, oh, why'd you do it this way? It's different. Uh, you know, I wish it was just the same. So it's easier for me. Sure. Um, but then I think that's where the decoupling comes from and, and, and why that's so important is because now I could I have an easier mechanism to promote those east west APIs into into north south EP, APIs. So what do we see? Um, well, we see, you know, and, and how does this you know, how does this occur? Well, we've been creating APIs and events. So generally what we see is step one is. What's out there? What have I already made? What what exists? And then step two is now that we know what exists, how do we how do we make that self self service? Here's our catalog. This is the stuff that we've made. We've organized it into what we think makes sense. Uh, now I've published it. Now I want to make it self service so that we're not setting up meetings, right? And then maybe I'm a you know an, a, a too much of an intro uh, an introvert, but uh, my goal is to get out of meetings, right? My goal is to get out of meetings as much as possible and into doing as much as possible. Um, and so, you know, that's really where the self-service comes in. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I get kind of tired of telling the same people or different people the same thing. Um, it'd be better if I just said, here it is, right? And if, it's, if it makes sense and the catalog makes sense, it's well-described, it's well-rationalized. I shouldn't have to go through meetings to talk about it. Um, it should should be an index, should be a catalog of what we had. And then we can self-service and then, you know, not that I don't like anybody, but we don't have to have meetings. We could spend more time doing. Um, and then, you know, step three would be, uh, you know, that, that controlled uh, exposure of, of events, right? So now if I, now, now I get to pick and choose, how do I want to represent my, comp my company? Um, and we've been doing this with APIs forever, right? We've been saying, these are the APIs that are internal. These are the ones that are external. 
Now, the, the interesting part about the external ones is, um, you know, APIs, I wouldn't even say are turning into. APIs have really turned into uh, the new UIs, right? APIs and events. And now we have to think about events this way. Um, APIs and events are, are turning into, instead of the UI being, you know, some screen that I click on and some button that I press, uh, they're really becoming, that's the way that you interact with my firm. That's the way you interact with my insurance company, right? That's that's the way you interact with me. Um, and, and, and for that reason, we're really seeing APIs and events um, becoming the you know the new the new front end right the new way of, of doing business, um, and then you know finally is you know expose everything externally and 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 you know welcome in new business right welcome in new uh, new opportunities and new ways new easier ways of integrating. So uh, so now I'm going to kind of take us through uh, a little bit of varying different personas. And and I'm going to go through a uh, a, a demo here of uh, kind of what you know. So I've been talking a lot. Um, is it all theory, or did I actually have something behind this? Well, you know, I actually have something behind this. Um, so the first is uh, let's talk about the API manager. So let's say I'm an API developer, and I want to develop an asset. I'll just call it an asset. That asset could even either manifest itself as a API or what we're calling async APIs, aka events. Um, so I'll come over here and uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my products and I'm going to add a new product. Um, so when I add a product, I'm going to say it's a new product and I'm going to give it a title. So let's say claims. So this is going to be, I'm an insurance company and I want to create a, a claims API or a claims product. Um, so now the claims product is gonna have all sorts of stuff. It's gonna say, well, what are the event, what are the APIs and async APIs or events that you wanna add to this product? For right now, I'm gonna say nothing. I'm just making the product. I'm just kind of creating my buckets right now. All right, so I'm gonna say next, and then it's gonna say, what's the rate limiting that you have? I'm okay with the defaults, but I could create multiple plans. I could say, there's a gold plan where you get unlimited capacity. There is a try it out plan where you only get 100 transactions per hour. And really, that's meant just so that you can't break me, right? You can't flood me with events, but it's enough for you to do your development, right? For you to consume my stuff. So I'm going to go ahead here and say, uh, yep, this is my this is my default plan. Uh, hit next. And so now this is the this is the interesting part. So what this is saying if I go back to uh, if I go back to this slide here of who am I exposing this to? So this is saying when this when this product goes live and I publish it, who gets to see it? So public means anyone that can get to that dev portal URL. If I've exposed it externally, anybody, um, or if I've exposed it internally, the people in inside of my firewall that have access anyone could see it. Authenticated means only the people that have come to my dev portal, logged in, then, you know, and, and I know who they are, right? They've already registered. They've already authenticated themselves. Um, that's what, that's what that little button means is only, you know, only those that I know who they are. Then at that point in time, after you've logged in, then you could see the contents of this product and then custom is I can create consumer orgs. I could say, here's a consumer org that's full of external people. Here's a consumer org that's full of internal people. Here's a consumer org full of external people that have paid me a boatload of money and they get special permissions or they've signed you know, all these special NDAs, therefore they get special permissions. So I could customize it to put people in these consumer orgs so only those that I really trust and care about and have gone through all the legal stuff have the ability to see, um, to see right? And that's what the, the custom button is. So I'm gonna go ahead and create my, my claim API. It's got a new product and a new rate limit. Then I'm gonna come on over here and I'm gonna add an async API and I'm gonna call this claims, or, or this is gonna be claim processing.
So what claim processing is going to do is claim processing is going to say, all right, so there's claims and you're probably going to want to interact with claims. You're going to want to create a claim. You're going to want to update a claim. You're going to want to pay out a claim. You're going to want to do stuff. Um, for this, I'm saying, no, no, no. I also want to be notified of claims. Let's say I'm an auditor and I want to be notified of any claim that's over two million bucks. Um, I want to be notified of any claim that might have attribute A, B, and C because we've seen that a lot of fraud has occurred whenever we notice A, B, and C. So then let's say that I have an, an existing application and that existing application is already processing claims and emitting events. And they're already doing that via Kafka. Well, I want to be able to connect to their Kafka. So, you know, I'm just going to make up some, you know, I'm going to make up some numbers and just say broker one.com, which is living on port 999. Um, then I could also authenticate to that cluster. Now, the important part is this is my gateway authenticating to that existing Kafka broker. I'm going to be exposing my own set of authentication to 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 my consumers, right? If we go back to if we go back to this picture here, what I'm describing right now is this portion of the line. This is my gateway authenticating to the backend service that's emitting events, right? So this is this is the point that I'm defining now. Um, now, an important point to note is all I really care about for that broker is just that it's Kafka, right? I don't care about the vendor, the, the specific distro of Kafka that you have. I don't care if it's the open source Kafka. I don't care if it's supported by... Um, you know, vendor ABC, if it's supported by Confluent, all I care about is that's just a Kafka endpoint. Um, and then I'm going to make my topic. So let's say this is claims.processing. Um, and then I'm going to say, all right, great, let's edit the API. So here I can do all sorts of really cool stuff. I could say on the channel claim.processing that has one operation, I also want to have a message. And from here, now I can define the message, right? I can define, so there's there's two things I could do. If I hook that up to a, uh, a Kafka topic that already has um, a, a definition, uh, a part of it, I believe arrow, um, then what, what we'll do is we'll get that, we'll interpret that in the tool, and then we'll automatically create the message format on your behalf. So that we'll, you know, we'll get the spec, we'll interpret the spec, and then we'll um, we'll go ahead and create the um, and then go ahead and create the, uh, the 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 definition on behalf. Or I could come in here and I could create my own object, right? I could come in here and I could say, here's this this content. This you know this object has these attributes. It's referencing this other object, and I can go ahead and make my make my payload. Um, so this is the messaging part. Um, then what I can do is I could go ahead and I could say, all right, I got my claims processing API, async API, um, and I also have my products. So now I can come into my claims and I could say, yep, now I do have an API. So I want to edit and I want to add my claims processing API, save it. So now, now I have a package and that package is my claims product. My claims product could be anything and everything associated with claims. It could be APIs to interact with claims. It could be events, um, which are notifying you of somebody else interacting with uh, with the claim. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and publish um, to Sandbox. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and publish that claims API. So we'll give it a minute here. And uh, now I'm going to come over to my dev portal. So what I've done so far is I've been the API developer. I wrote my claims product and I wrote my claims async API. Oops. Then when I published it, that pushed the claims API to the dev portal. So now that my, my app developers can see it, it also pushed that claims uh that that claims api async api to the gateway 
Um, so as you could see before, um, so now what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to switch gears. So we've done the provider side here. I'm going to switch gears to the consumer side. And now I'm going to pretend that I'm an app developer and I'm going to browse stuff. So what I could do is I can come in here and I can come into the dev portal. I could register. I could sign in or I could come over to API products and I want to say, ah, what's out there? Um, I'm really kind of interested in claims. So I can come here. I could see the claims. Then I can come here and say, oh, there's the claims processing API. I could see that it's a Kafka API, which meaning it's async. Um, so I could see that it's an async API. This is going to link me out. The protocol is Kafka. And then I could also see these are the these are the brokers, right? This is how I would connect to it. I could download the documentation. Um, and I could also see, you know, here is the, you know, how do I call it? Um, so we have this, uh, we have Java as an example. Um, and, you know, we could also do uh, console. But, you know, we, we have a bunch of other different languages here on how do I consume it and giving the customer, your consumer, as much as possible, as many accelerators as possible so that they can consume your APIs and your async APIs as quickly as possible. So that's the that's the dev portal there. Um, I went and browsed it. I saw my claim API. Uh, now what I could do is I can create an application which is consuming those events. So this is the uh, this is the connection that we had created earlier. Of uh, these are the APIs. And then when I went to the dev portal and I got my sample code, then I could write my application here, which connects to the gateway. So if I marry this picture here with the one above, it's effectively flipped sideways, right? So this is my event gateway, and this is my backend. And if I marry that with this picture here. You could see this is my consumer up here. Here's my API, and then here's my backend. So it's you know we're I'm kind of zooming out and zooming in. It's really the same picture, just oriented a different way um, and, and focused on different things. But this is now what we call um, you know this is what we think uh, APIs and API management is gonna you know is the next step. Um, we know APIs. APIs are great. Um, we know events, we know events are great. Um, and we really kind of see that marriage coming together um, because, you know, what we started off is there's various different use cases where just doing stuff over HTTP, uh, you know, there's, you can do a lot, but you can't do everything. Um, so, uh, you know, I can't give any presentation uh, ever without giving a 90s movie reference. So, uh, you know, I always go, well, would you like to know more? Uh, if anyone knows what reference was, this is a movie. What movie this I'm referring, you know, uh, feel free to paste something in the chat so that, you know, we're on the same page. Um, but if you'd like to know more uh, in the in the deck, I've included a series of different links, um, one of which uh, that I really wanted to highlight is uh, is this link here. Um, Dale Lane has done a lot of really good work. Uh, he's he's, you know, effectively gone through the same thing I have, uh, and he's also made. Uh, you know, three demos here, the admin perspective, uh, the, the the provider side perspective, and the consumer side perspective. So a great way to get uh, additional info and a great way to, uh, to, to know more. So with that being said, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, just take any questions that may that that may be out there.